Hello, everyone. Um, a very warm welcome to our 15th webinar in a series that we started back in May. Uh, we took a short break in August, and we are so very excited to be back up and running again. So thank you so many to everyone who has joined today. I can see um, people are still joining as we as we talk right now. My name is Stacey Sinclair, and I'm the head of technology and innovation here at Planet Elliot. And today we are discussing negotiating contracts post COVID-19, exploring key risk areas and practical tips on how to protect yourself in, nego in negotiations in this environment. Given the ever changing status of COVID-19, it's, it's important that parties consider these issues at the outset. You know, what happens if X or Y happens in the future and how your contract deals with that. And therefore, we're delighted to have um, Fennec Elliott partner Jatinda Garsha and senior associate Edward Colclough here to today to discuss these issues. Jatinda has nearly 20, experience, 20 years of experience in non-contentious domestic and international construction and energy projects. He acts for the full spectrum of clients, including financial institutions, pension and property funds, government departments, investors, developers, contractors, and so forth advising right from the inception and procurement strategies right through to project completion. My apologies for that. Edward, too, is a part of our non-contentious team, advising on all stages of construction and engineering projects. So Jatinda and Edward will speak for about the next 30 minutes or so, and then we will take questions at the end. And hopefully you've by now seen the questions um, box on the right-hand side of the toolbar. And please do submit questions as we go. Um, I will put as many questions as possible to Edward and Jatinda at the end, um, time allowing, so please don't hold back. And the questions will be put anonymous, anonymously to them. And um, rest assured, the slides and this recording um, will be available on our website uh, afterwards in due course, so you can access that on demand. And so without further delay, um, Jatinda, Edward, I shall pass over to you. Thank you very much, Stacey. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining the, the webinar. Uh, I hope everybody keeping safe and well and has managed to have some form of summer holiday. Um, so, as Stacey said, the purpose of today's call, uh, sorry, the webinar, is to look at how to provide for COVID-19 in future contracts. Now, coming from a front-end negotiation point of view, I can see that coronavirus is one of those events, like our old friend Brexit, that's going to have a specific bearing on contracts for years to come. So when picking up contracts, parties are going to be looking at where is that coronavirus wording? Now, for the purposes of this webinar, Ed will briefly set the scene and then consider where we are and in particular in relation to reliance on force majeure and accordingly probably the need for a COVID style drafting. We will then look at considering the essential requirements and considerations for any specific COVID-19 clause from the perspective of both the employer and the contractor and also time permitting look at some sort of alternative contractual mechanisms that the parties can use in order to share in this potential COVID-19 risk. We will then finally end up by looking at some other kind of ancillary provisions that may also need to be negotiated in the wider context of COVID-19. So without further ado I'll hand you uh, firstly over to Edward who will take you through the first few slides. Thanks Jacinda. So just to kick off, we thought it was probably worth having a look at COVID, where we are today, how it's become the new norm in our lives and governs so much of what we do, including negotiating construction contracts. As Jatinda said, it's worth bearing in mind at the outset the similarities, and a lot of these principles did apply or do apply equally to Brexit provisions that we became so familiar with at, throughout the course of last year. And that's all looking at uncertainty in the contract, how the contract responds to uncertainty and how it apportions and allocates risk. So just to look at where we've come from and where we are today, um, December last year, this was on nobody's radar, but the first patient developed symptoms of coronavirus. We then see the identification of coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, um, at the beginning of Jan, 
and the first death recorded in China. Now, at the top there, you can see the BA planes towards the end of January. Um, BA suspended its flights to and from mainland China, showing that this was developing as a serious issue, but still seen as quite a localized uh, problem. We get our first uh, death, re recorded death in the UK, 5th of um, March, and a week or so later, the World Health Organization declares a pandemic. Now, that's an important date for various reasons that we're going to come on to, particularly when we start looking at the force majeure provisions. Moving along, you can see as the UK death toll continues to rise towards the back end of March, um, we see government intervention through the furlough scheme being introduced, schools being shut and the PM ordering a lockdown. On the same day as that, on the 23rd of March, the CLC did produce its site operating procedures that did allow construction to continue under um, monitored and social distancing um, requirements. Moving along, you can see the death toll increasing by 6th of April. We're up to 5,000 deaths and in a glimmer of good news, we've got Captain Tom there at the top um, completing his 100th lap. Moving on to this next slide, and this really does show the uh, boom and increase in the death toll um, and the real human impact it has taken. 6th of May, we're up to 30,000, and as we get to the 5th of June, it's 40,000. We're also seeing um, throughout June, towards the end, you can see there a localised lockdown in Leicester, showing that it's moving to lockdowns in local areas. 4th of July, pubs and places of worship reopen, and we also get the latest edition, version 5, of the CLC site operating procedures. Just moving along there, I've got a headline from the 27th of July where Google um, made noises that they weren't expecting staff back till July 2021. That's worth taking a step back because there's so many different sectors, businesses and industries that are going to be affected, many of which the construction industry would no doubt have fed off um, going forward. And then scooting along just to the end there, a big milestone for many schools reopening at the 1st of September. So I guess there's two take home points from that. Firstly, how quickly this is all developed. I mean, if you did want to draw comparisons with Brexit, Brexit, you had a bit more of a lead in time to think things through. A lot of the drafting for these COVID clauses has been reacting to circumstances. Um, and in my experience, it's still developing and maturing as we um, get to grips with COVID. Um, and the second thing is that question mark at the end. Where are we heading? I mean, only this week we've heard of rising infection rates. And one thing, as Jatinda said at the beginning, is for sure, this is not going to go away overnight. It's something that's going to be on our radar, going to be addressing construction contracts going forward. So is there a ready-made, easy um, solution in our contracts? Well, at face value, you might think it's the force majeure provision. Um, COVID quite easily you could package into a force majeure, an act of God, an unforeseen event. The first thing to note here is English law has no general concept of force majeure, so it has to be expressly drafted into the contract. It's not going to be implied in by the courts or by law. So if you haven't got a force majeure provision in your contract, force majeure certainly isn't going to come to the rescue. Thankfully, a lot of the standard forms that we do use do contain force majeure-like provisions, often treating um, the event as a neutral event, giving the contractor additional time, but not money. Two key um, themes we see of force majeure events. Um, the first is that third bullet point down there, the fact that it has to be an event which is beyond the reasonable control of the parties or party concerns. And secondly, this element of force majeure clauses, it needs to be an event which is unforeseeable. Quite often you'll see force majeure provisions that exclude foreseeable or foreseen events. Just to give an example of that, I pulled up the NEC4 prevention event definition, um, just the element that deals with this, and you can see how important it is. To get the prevention event, you've got to find an event that an experienced contractor would have judged at the date of contract to have such a small chance of occurring that it would have been unreasonable for him to have allowed for it. That's why that date, the 11th of March 2020, when the World Health Organization declares a pandemic, is so crucial because there's a very good and strong argument that contracts entered into after that date, and certainly now, 
the force majeure provisions aren't going to bite because they're not going to clear that second hurdle of being um, an unforeseen event. So with that in mind, if you do want COVID addressed in your contracts, um, it's looking like you're going to need some bespoke or tailored drafting included. Um, and with that in mind, Jatinda is going to have a look at some options and things to consider on this front. Yeah, so just before moving on, a very good point that Ed has made about the foreseeability test is something that also comes up in change in law. Now, as well as claiming force majeure, <laughs> I know lots of contractors have been in looking at relying on a, on a change in law in relation to their entitlements at the moment. But even in relation to change in law, it's not unusual in a construction contract to see some wording that says any entitlement for a, for a uh, an, for any change in law is subject to that change in law having been not reasonably foreseeable at the time that you entered into the contract. Now, just as, as Ed has said about force majeure, given where we are now, I think there'll be some difficulty potentially uh, in claiming anything that's saying that changes in law in relation to COVID are not any longer foreseeable. So I think there's going to be potentially a, a dispute around that standard wording that we always have included in contracts. Now, I think in relation to that foreseeability test, I think perhaps we will start looking at either contractors resisting that drafting in relation to COVID or some form of uh, adequately defining what we mean by reasonably foreseeable in this context by reference to perhaps draft bills or um, or, or maybe draft legislation that, that's around at the time that the contract is entered into. But it very much looks like a, a specific COVID-19 style wording is, is almost going to be essential going forward. And just looking at this slide, I think a helpful starting point when drafting any COVID-19 provision is to have a look at the CLC future proofing guidance, which itself has produced some amendments to the JCT contract and the NEC contracts. Now, under, the, under that guidance, there are three options for, for COVID-19. There's an extension of time only, there's an extension of time and all of the contractors lost an expense, and then there's this extension of time with some sort of predetermined percentage of, of loss and expense or possibly even an overall cap on liability. So what is clear is that from a commercial perspective, the first thing that is gonna to need to be discussed and considered is an entitlement to loss and expense. Uh, what that looks like and well, whether the contractor gets one at all. Now, even, in, even though the CLC uh, pro future proofing guidance provide some basic amendments to the JCT contract and NEC. I think by its own admission, it accepts that more intricate changes are probably going to be required to reflect the party's requirements. So with that in mind, I suppose, the first place to start is we need a definition of COVID-19. Now, with the terms such as working from home and social distancing and uh, self-isolation now in common use, the Oxford English Dictionary has actually updated, has been updated to include COVID-19 words, uh, including pandemic, along the lines of set out in the slide. But from a, from a legal perspective, I think a legal definition from a contractual perspective, from my experience, doesn't tend to be too contentious, unlike a Brexit clause is used to be. Now, most definitions around COVID-19 will end up as, as set out on the slide here. Um, What's actually going to be more challenging when you come to drafting contracts is defining the trigger points of the entitlement and in particular any preconditions and mitigation factors upon which that entitlement is based. Now, or things to, to consider in particular when you list out what events are being directly affected by the COVID event have to be things like, I suppose, shortage of labour, um, delays in importation of materials, delays caused by implementation of public health measures, exercising of statutory powers, for instance, or even, if you can get away with it, I suppose, consequences of infection or suspected infection of employees or self-isolation. So there's gonna be a considerable amount of, uh, of topics and uh, to be included within that list in any kind of discussion around a COVID-19 style wording. So looking at COVID-19 in particular from a employer's perspective, now 
what does the employer want to do? You might be, you know, not unsurprisingly, the, the employer wants to limit uh, or control the contractor's entitlement to uh, to any kind of uh, COVID provision or, or entitlement. And I think some of the provisions that employers are tending to look at at this moment in time are listed here on the on this slide. Now, the first one is express acknowledgement that the contractor has programmed and priced the works to comply with COVID-19 measures. Now, in, from the drafting that I'm seeing, this can include things like having a, a specific COVID-19 management plan agreed and attached to the contract, which takes account of all current COVID-19 style guidance, these the CLC site operating uh, procedures, statutory requirements, industry guidance, etc. And then it's a it's a precondition to any COVID-19 related claim that the COVID management plan has been complied with fully. Then you, you normally tend to see some drafting coupling this with some sort of enhanced programming requirements and even early warning mechanisms. I've seen in relation to COVID-19, early warning mechanisms for COVID-19 um, being introduced into JCT style contracts. Secondly, uh, express acknowledgement that any COVID-19 entitlement is not treated as a force majeure of rent. Now, this is an this is an important point. So, what employers are trying to do here is look to provide that whatever COVID-19 clause is agreed, that is the contractor's sole and exclusive remedy. They, they, they are prevented from trying to claim an EOT for COVID-19 under any other provision of the contract. Now, as an example, in fact, I've seen some amendments to the JCT contract to clause 2.2612, which deals with exercise of statutory powers by the government, to expressly state that that clause does not uh, apply to COVID-19 events. So I think, look, going forward, I think from a contractor's perspective, you will need to ensure that all relevant events that you think you should be entitled to under, are, are included within this specific COVID-19 event. Uh, limiting the trigger to the introduction of, say, more onerous and restrictive site operating procedures. So similar to a change in law, some employers are trying to, to, to limit the, the entitlement solely to changes in the CLC operating procedures. Now, this obviously wouldn't capture off-site activities and therefore, again, is a, is a consideration that a contractor should give when, when, when trying to agree this provision with, with, a, with an employer. More generally speaking, contractors are under a general duty to mitigate COVID-19 uh, and any losses. In fact, clause JCT clause 25.61 states that the contractor shall constantly use his best endeavours to prevent the delay in the progress of the works or any section, however so caused. Now, this obligation to use best endeavours at law uh, will include a requirement to expend some money at the contractor's cost and resequence the works, etc. Now, what employers may look to do is to enhance this duty in particular, include provisions making it a precondition to any EOT that the contractor obtains labor, materials, goods, et cetera, from alternative suppliers or makes alternative arrangements in relation to supply of labor. Now, obviously there is a, a massive cost implication of agreeing such a, such a wide provision which is why, not unsurprisingly, I'm also seeing wording introduced by, by contractors doing the, the converse, saying when they're talking about this best endeavours obligation, it doesn't include having to go off and get alternative or see, seek alternative suppliers. And in fact, actually defining the best endeavours obligation here to only incurring insubstantial or de minimis amounts of money. Now, other things that the employers may look to include in contracts would include perhaps a, a disclosure on an open book basis of any government relief that the contractor has received. For example, furlough payments. Again, I've seen drafting where the contractor has to provide this, this, this information and it's taken into consideration when assessing compensation events. Uh, and I've also seen employers trying to limit entitlements to 
changes in mandatory requirements only and therefore not including industry standard guidance but actual mandatory requirements of the government only briefly from a contractor's perspective um, i mean using the clc zone drafting here the main concern obviously is to try and make the covid 19 trigger event as wide as possible now in this respect i think what contractors are looking to looking for or may want to include in contracts me maybe considering not just including a reference to COVID-19, but a wider definition to pandemic, just like the CLC do in their um, entitlement. Um, not only including infectious human disease, but perhaps also, as Ed said earlier, including a reference to localized and widespread occurrences. So not quite a pandemic that, that's capturing the world, but maybe a localized occurrences. But obviously, any kind of drafting would need to be considered against uh, not to cut across any force majeure provisions. Uh, inclusion of references to recommendations. Now, uh, the, the reference to recommendation in the second bullet point here aims to cover some of the current arguments that are going on uh, in the market where COVID-19 entitlements are only being linked to compliance with mandatory laws or mandatory requirements only. The CLC in their in their in their um, definition or their entitlement at uh, bullet point three includes a reference to any consequences of a pandemic. Now, in my opinion, that that's probably going to be too broad and for to be acceptable by an employer. However, I suppose it starts as a good good starting point for discussions before you actually end up getting to a to a to a list. Um, um, Sorry, I'm conscious of time, so just moving on very quickly. The only other, the other things that I'm seeing in the market, which we might need want to to consider, are ways of actually providing flexibility in contracts in order to allow contracts to be entered into at this stage, rather than being put on hold as they are. Now, I've just set out three here. One is a, a pay and gain mechanism. So obviously, at the moment, contracts are being based upon programs which take into consideration all of the COVID-19 style uh, requirements, including social distancing. Once those requirements are lifted, obviously there's a potential that programs will be bought, bought back a little bit. And the question then is, if the program, if works are completed before they are meant to, can the parties agree some sort of sharing of that, of that, of the savings or the prelim costs? Break clauses. I mean, does the does the contract allow for um, break points in the contract? For instance, if you're doing works on a floor by floor basis, there's a natural break point at the end of a floor. Can there be something in, introduced in the contract which allows for the contract to be suspended or or broken at that point uh, to to allow for you know some more certainty? And finally, I suppose, good faith. Now, the government is quite keen on, on parties acting responsibly and fairly in relation to COVID-19. So, I mean, perhaps consider whether we're going to see an increase in collaborative style contracts or even introduction of, um, of good faith wording into contracts. Now, we all know that there, are, there is legally there's some difficulties with good faith in, 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 in English law and contracts. However, at least it puts down a marker of the intent, I suppose, for, for the contractual parties. I'll just hand you now back to Ed. Thanks, Jitenda. So those COVID clauses tend to be quite self-contained, but of course there's a number of other knock-on effects and issues that parties should be aware about when they're negotiating their contract. So we're just gonna quickly run through some of those. First and foremost, payment. I mean, if ever cash flow was the lifeblood of the construction industry, it's going to be now and over the next 12 months or so. We've got very used to seeing payment terms stretched and amendments to um, standard form payment provisions. But again, I'm starting to see some pushback on that. Um, Non-payment is not automatically a termination, right? So you need to look at your contractual entitlements um, in the event of non-payment. Now, we've all got very familiar with the good protection we get from the Construction Act with the prescriptive payment mechanism for getting your notices on time, the right to suspend any or all of the works for non-payment, and of course, the right to adjudicate at any time. One thing I would just caution 
um, particularly contractors to watch out for. It's all very well in the event of non-payment, drafting up your seven day letter of an intention to suspend, which is quite a powerful tool. Um, but it's worth watching out for collateral warranties that are often signed at the beginning of the job to funders that require you to, in addition, give the funder 30 plus days of notice of any intention to suspend or uh, terminate. That can often take the real wind out of the uh, contractor's um, position um, at that stage. And just quickly, we've got a case here, the Rochford Construction Limited case. I mean, over the next 12 months, we are likely to see payment mechanisms tested and coming under scrutiny. And this is a prime example, really, where the final date for payment was linked to the issue of a VAT invoice. I must say, that's not that unusual. You do see it cropping up on contracts. But when the court actually looked at the payment mechanism, it found that it, it didn't comply with the Construction Act. The final date for payment had to be pegged and linked back to the due date for payment. It couldn't be floating um, and dependent on the issuing of a um, VAT invoice. Um, the payment uh, mechanism was found to be inadequate and the scheme applied in those circumstances. Suspension rights, rights to terminate. I mean, well, what I'm seeing, and you've typically seen this, um, employers go for gold here. They look for a right to terminate at will for any reason, um, to cut and run from the project um, as and when they can. Often, in addition, they'll look to um, limit liability for loss of profits. But um, that's a discussion that can be had um, at a later date. COVID-specific break clauses, as Jatinda alluded to there, um, you can see those creeping in and using provisions in the contract um, that are already there, suspension provisions that JCT already provides for, suspension of the works, um, and after two months, that triggers a right to uh, walk away. And that two months is increasing in a number of contracts that I'm looking at and being amended to a later date. And then there's various different options on deferred possession or sectional completion. Sectional completion is definitely one worth thinking about, particularly if you're a contractor and you're feeling you're taking a number of risks to try and de-risk certain sections of the work and having a separate LD mechanism for them. Limitations of liability. Um, this is often always a tough argument, but I think it's only going to get tougher in the months to come. Um, if you want limitations of liability, you need quite careful and express drafting in the contract to provide you with the protection you want. I know for a fact that PI insurers in this sensitive market are very much pushing net contribution clauses more than they ever had. Particularly, you want to be careful if consultants manage to get them in, particularly in design and build and innovation scenarios. Express exclusions for loss, the JCT already provides a, an option for the contractor to limit liability for use, loss of profit and consequential loss as a result of defective design. And um, again, that is a provision that I'm seeing used more than I ever have previously. Normally it used to be struck out. Overall limitations on liability. That's quite, a, quite, quite an interesting point. Um, one, the argument to get it in the first place. Two, what the level will be on. Um, but thirdly, um, the basis on which that cap is um, to be held. From an employer's perspective, and particularly funders push this, they want it on an each and every claim basis to mirror something along the lines of what the PI policy would be. However, um, contractors will typically argue that's not really a cap if uh, the claim can be brought a number of times up to that limit. They would much rather ring, ring fence uh, a set amount against the contract. Time bar provisions. Um, they can be used for limiting liability. They're often sold as a proactive project management tool, um, but contractors who fail to comply with them will lose their entitlement and it will limit the employer's liability um, in respect of the entitlement that should have been notified. Now I can see from an employer's perspective, you're definitely not gonna to want to find out at the end of the job, there's a catch or COVID claim coming in. So I can see you're gonna to want to deal with issues as and when they arise. Um, thing to watch out for there is the time limit. Um, NEC we know gives eight weeks, but you see that reduced down drastically to anything I've seen in bespoke contracts to seven to 14 days, which is quite tight to comply with given the harsh consequences. Um, we've also got their subcaps on liability. A typical one to include would be a subcap on liquidated damages if you can negotiate that in. And then I guess, as is always the case with any limitation of liability, watch out for um, any exclusions um, that are drafted into the contract because they can single-handedly totally undermine the cap that you think you've negotiated.
So Jatinder, we've got our contract ready, we've come to an agreement on a COVID clause and we've even agreed where we stand on a limitation of liability. Now we just need the contract signed and I think people are finding this difficult with remote working, self-isolating and also the holiday period that we're just coming out of. Traditional wetting signatures um, can cause a problem in this respect, particularly when it comes to witnessing um, documents. Um, it's advised that parties consider using the likes of counterpart provisions, which means you don't need one document signed by all parties together. You can use counterparts, which separate documents when signed and dated um, and exchanged correctly count as an original document. Also, in terms of putting contracts together, we are seeing references to data rooms being used to incorporate a whole load of documents instead of getting people to print it out. That's fine as long as um, it's we can be certain what's in the data room and what's out. Going back to the basics of the contracts, you want certainty as to what's included in your contract. Deeds, uh, just to finish up here, deeds um, so commonly used in the construction industry to benefit from your 12-year liability period have enhanced formalities, um, particularly in relation to how they're signed. Typically, you either need two directors, director and a company secretary, or a director and a witness. Now, the Law Commission has very much given the thumbs up to electronic signatures. The difficulty seems to come with having um, signatures witnessed, which you need for um, a deed, particularly if you're using that third bullet point director in the presence of a witness. Now, there's nothing in the Companies Act that says that the party witnessing the um, signature has to be independent, although best practice means um, it should be. But in theory, you could get a family member to witness. They're not giving validity to the document, they're just witnessing the signature, but legal best practice, you would want an independent party, so um, it, it couldn't be challenged at a later date. Um, the government has recently made some changes that wills can be witnessed by video, Zoom and FaceTime, however unfortunately that doesn't yet apply to construction contracts, so um, if you did want something witnessed, um, it, it should be done um, as usual in person um, in the current climate to give you the full protection. And I think that brings us back to Stacey. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, um, Jatinda. That's been a, a brilliant um, overview of, of what we need to, to watch out for. Um, I think we shall take some questions now um, from the audience. Um, turning first to um, possibly Ed, um, someone's had a question about claims um, and possibly what is the employer's justification um, for not allowing the contractor to claim loss and expense? Okay, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll start on that, I suppose. Um, I suppose the justification for that is that the COVID-19 is a an, is a neutral event. It's an event that neither party controlled or possibly, you know, had any control, or definitely doesn't have any control over. Therefore, the justification for the employer to say is, given that it's a neutral event, the party should share in the, the loss and expense or the, or the loss and the additional cost jointly. Now, the employer is actually responsible for the costs and expenses in the extent that if, the, if an extension of time is granted, then obviously the employer cannot claim uh, liquidated damages. So whatever, there may be a loss of revenue, et cetera, to the employer. So the employer is sharing in, in the pain in the sense that it's no longer liable or, or cannot claim uh, any revenue. Um, and therefore, the justification then is the because the employer is picking up some, some costs and expenses, then the contractor should also pick up their own costs and expenses. And I suppose if you look at the JCT contract, in particular, not so much the NEC, but JCT contract, force majeure in it as an event only entitles the, the contractor to time and not money. So I think the JCT and also 22, 2.2612 about exercise of statutory powers, both of those events, whilst they entitle the contractor to an extension of time, because they are deemed to be a neutral event, neither of them entitle the, the, the contractor to any additional loss and expense. So it's the fact that it's a neutral event and the employer's losing out because they can't have any more revenue. The contractor's loss in, re in this respect should be the fact that they can't pick up their loss and expense. I think that's the overall justification from, from the employer's perspective. Mm. Ed, Thank did you. you. Wanna... 
I think no, I think that's right. I mean, typically that's the position I'm seeing uh, parties coming to at the moment. Um, contractors getting time and not money. Um, that's to say, these are on shorter projects where maybe an assessment can be made on what will happen um, in the next 12 months. But if you're entering into a contract with a much longer time frame, I think the contractor would certainly not want to be gambling that risk completely um, and have a good argument that there should be a bit more of a, something like a pain gain share mechanism, I think Shatinda mentioned earlier on. Thank you, Ed. Thanks for that. Um, I think I, let's, um, we've, had, we've had one question about um, VAT invoices and um, following the recent decision. Um, are you seeing any changes um, in VAT invoices? Well, it's a very recent decision. So um, in, in terms of drafting, people are still grappling with um, the implications. I mean, I guess first and foremost, if you look at the likes of the JCT, it doesn't man mention VAT invoices. It's left to the parties to deal with through an accounting process and the um, payment process from the Construction Act is kept separately. The suggestions that I've seen tend to su suggest that is not a bad approach and it saves you um, ending up in problems, tinkering with payment mechanisms and then finding out they don't work. There have been suggestions about getting VAT invoices issued at the time the application is made, but I understand if um, the amount applied for is later chipped down, either through the payment process or a pay less notice, um, that can create all sorts of accounting uh, difficulty because the invoice creates a VAT liability that then needs to be sorted out through various credit notes. So um, they seem to be the two kind of major views that have come out of that case, um, but it's still very early days to see how the drafting reacts. Uh, one thing I would add is you typically do see in construction contracts um, provisions where, for example, if a party hasn't given a collateral warranty, the employer's got the right to withhold sums, notwithstanding the payment mechanism. The payment mechanism runs, but there's a contractual right to withhold payments. Whether parties will look to use that, I don't know, but that's just the thought. Thanks. Um, we've had a couple of questions in about um, foreseeability. And I wonder if maybe we could just turn to that turn to that briefly. Um, someone in the audience is um, experience, experiencing feedback where actually um, COVID-19, um, it, it's, it's now a known event. So the argument is, you know, it's, it's now a known event and therefore no additional clauses are necessary. Um, conversely, another member of the audience is saying, um, the pandemic is now foreseeable, but there's there's elements of it which might not be foreseeable. Um, how long will it last? Um, if the disease is going to hit your project, um, closure of the site, and and so forth. Um, Jitinder or Edward, can you maybe say a little bit more around some foreseeability points? Yeah, I mean, the problem now is the fact that we've had the pandemic and we've seen the the problems related to the pandemic i think what we, if we don't have some express wording dealing with this specific specific point there is there's room for argument on both sides as to whether something going forward is foreseeable or not now from from what's happened it's what is foreseeable is if covid-19 hits your project there's going to be there's going to be problems and issues uh, that need to be resolved the extent of those it's arguable whether it was foreseeable. Was it foreseeable that you'd have to close the site? Was You know that there's going to be some, some effect of COVID-19, but what is the extent of the foreseeability of that? So I think if, if we're going to leave it without touching upon it contractually at all, I think you are going to go, come to arguments about what, did, what was foreseeable or not. And I think you see a lot of case law or you see a lot of disputes about what did foreseeability mean in this context? So I think... Because of that, I think the only sensible approach to have is to have a specific provision which deals with it and takes away that argument about what was foreseeable and what was not foreseeable by actually introducing some wording to deal with it specifically. Thanks, Eugenia. Um, I think uh, looking at the time, we might be able to take um, one more question. Um, someone has a question about um, if you have any um, top tips or effective negotiating strategies 
on how to get the parties or, or, or employers to, to share the pain, as it were. I think but, pricing risk is always a good one. It focuses the party's attention when the employer um, works out what, what the risk that he's passing through the contract or dumping down to the contractor, what it's costing him. That's often the best way. And once that's been seen, as Jatinda um, mentioned, there's a lot of collaborative ways where that risk can then be shared and managed without it having to be passed um, so, so bluntly down. That tends mm -hmm. to be a good tactic um, just to kick things off. I think the, the pain gain share mechanism, which I briefly touched upon earlier, is, is a really good example. And it's something I'm seeing used in lots of contracts. You know, people are, 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 are programming at this moment in time based upon the information in front of them. And that is, you know, there has to be social distancing on sites. It's difficulty to get, difficult to get your employees to, to the site. So all of these factors are having to be built into the contract at this moment in time. And I think if a contractor is willing to say to an employer, look, if for whatever reason we could, you know, the, the, this, the, the rules are relaxed and we end up being in a position where we can actually finish before um, at the time that we were, were meant to, there's obviously, it might be a fixed price contract, but I'm happy to share some of the, 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 the gains in the prelim cost that, that might result from the fact that because of the relaxation, I'm going to be off site quicker. And I think as part of the negotiations in that front, I think the, it's justifiable for the contractor to then say to the employer, however, if the, the program cannot be brought forward or there's, the, there's an enhancement in, in restrictions because of what happens in COVID going forward, I'd also want you to be in a position where you would share some of that loss and expense with me. And I think it kind of balances out the approach to say, on one hand, the contractor will give, and the other hand, the employer should give. And I think, that's always a good starting position. It, it, I suppose in a position where, as I said earlier on, this is a neutral event and the employer is already suffering a loss, potentially loss of revenue. In order to justify to the employer why they should pay the contractor a little bit more, I suppose the, the, the contractor has to show that it is also willing to, to give up in some, some of its gains. And I think also looking at furlough payments, et cetera, is, a, is another good example. If a contractor can sh say to an employer, look, if I do get some form of furlough payments, I'll share that with you. So I'm not going to claim for those in the loss and expense, but I will, on an open book basis, show you what I'm getting. And maybe there's some deal to be done around that. And also, if I'm willing to give you on that hand, then again, I, I would hope that you would also be able to give me some loss and expense going forward, you know, if, if it gets worse. Thanks, Jutinda. Um, and I think, looking at the time, that's that's all the time we have um, for for questions. Um, that's been a really fantastic last 40 minutes or so. And thank you so much to Tinda and Edward on that. Um, and thank you very much to the audience for joining us today. Um, it's it's brilliant to be back. And thank you again. Um, please do um, please do uh, send in any any further questions you might have. Um, the, again, the slides and the recording will be available on our website um, shortly, and you can find that in the past webinar section. Um, and then if I could um, just please give a plug to our next webinar, um, which will be taking place in, in two weeks' time. Again, 12 noon on, on that Thursday, on 24th of September, where um, our Fennec Elliott partner, Jeremy Glover, and I will be considering how dispute resolution and dispute avoidance has evolved over the past six months in light of COVID-19, and we'll address some legal, um, practical, and technological issues as well. Um, so thank you very much again, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Ed, Jatinda, and um, please stay safe, everyone, and we hope to see you again virtually very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.